Welcome back to another episode of Left of Boom. I'm Hope Hodge Sack. Today, we're tackling a beloved piece of military culture, the myths, rumors, and legends that get passed down from generation to generation of service members, and sometimes are even taught as history, whether or not they actually happened. To do that, I sat down with a colleague and personal friend who for years was known to readers of Stars and Stripes by another title, The Rumor Doctor. Jeff Shogel is one of the most beloved faces in the Pentagon Press Corps. Unless, that is, you're an official behind the lectern in the briefing room and he has a question for you. In his 13 years covering the military, he has reported on military operations in Iraq, Haiti, and other locations, and has never shied away from asking the tough questions the public really wants to know, such as, what will the Space Force anthem be? What's really going on with those Navy UFO videos? And where the heck is the secret fighter pilot bar in the Pentagon? He's now the Pentagon correspondent for Task and Purpose. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. I would say I'm not so much beloved as tolerated in the Pentagon Press Corps, just uh, for your audience. Well, let's agree to disagree. (laughs) I first got to know you about a decade ago through your Stars and Stripes column, The Rumor Doctor. It was informative and funny, and a lot of what you did was unearthing facts that crushed beloved military myths and legends into the dust. Your job description these days is a lot broader, but you still investigate and debunk a fair amount of military folklore. So how did that first gig come about? How did you become the rumor doctor? Well, it was almost by accident. We had received uh, at Stars and Stripes a letter to the editor complaining that the Army had changed the phrase battle buddy to warrior companion. And when I called up the Army, I said, why did this happen? They said, we didn't make any change like that. And so the first story I wrote was just kind of whimsical, saying, no, battle buddy has not become warrior companion. As a side note, I found out about a year later that this was uh, a joke that uh, someone had written a mock army message and uh, it had been taken seriously by the army. And I heard even Odierno was briefed. But afterwards, my editor at the time decided this would become a recurring column. And the way he announced it to the staff was he had a whiteboard and he did a kind of a, he drew a figure of a face with a beard and a doc, it's you know, like some kind of doctor's insignia on it. And the staff said, wait a minute, that's Shogel. And they said, yes. He, and he wanted me to become, uh, this to become a permanent item, which I did for more than a year. And it was, it was, it was, it was interesting because I was unaware of the just scope of military lore out there of myths and legends that are taken as sacrosanct um, and the gospel truth, which are just complete fabrications. And then, of course, there's the constant stream of disinformation, which, as we now know, has become such a regular part of, uh, of life. But I was not lacking for stories. No doubt. And as you said, some are really sacrosanct. They're part of sort of this treasured mythology of military branches. Have you gotten angry letters and emails for your trouble as you go about getting to the ground truth on these uh, rumors? Oh, yes. Uh, one of my earliest, uh, it was either a story about how the, um, the, the, the Marine Corps story about the blood stripe, which is, uh, a uniform, which is a uniform matter, or the origin of the term devil dogs had no bearing in reality. I received some kind of uh, an email from a Marine it was glorious in in its profanity, which I will spare your audience. But there was a, a a line in there that said something to the effect of "The next time I'm in the field, I'm going to use stars and stripes for toilet paper," which I think is a really bad idea because, first of all, the printer's ink does stain, and it will <laughs> cause a rash. <laughs> so the joke's on him, I guess. I, I hope he didn't try it. Was there one particular service that you found had an outsized portion of sort of the the military mythology? So both of those uh, rumors that you just mentioned were Marine Corps specific. That's right. I think 
the Marine Corps offered a target rich environment because as part of recruit training, Marines essentially become PhD doctorates in Marine Corps history from 1775 to the present. By the time they leave, they can name every significant event in the Marine Corps that has ever happened. And the fact that some of what they learn may not have a bearing in reality um, strikes a nerve, um, especially because the Marines owe their existence to a high esprit de corps. But there are other services. The Army actually, from what I had learned, uh, would test NCOs on a complete myth that in every flagpole on an Army installation there was a razor and a uh, match in the in what's called the truck, which is the ball at the very top of the flagpole, just in case the installation were overrun, someone would have to climb up the flagpole, unscrew the truck, use the razor to cut off the flag, use the match to set it on fire, and apparently there was a pistol buried something like four paces from the base, which the soldier would then have to dig up and shoot himself. And I called up the army and I said, so soldiers have to shoot themselves? No, they do not. <laughs> uh, the, the U.S. military has never ordered that. Um, and also uh, they checked and there was never any specifications in the truck to be hollow so that it could have a match or scissors or anything like that, any implements of destruction. Uh, but that was taken as serious, that that was part of, you know, apparently when you became an NCO, how many paces from the base is the pistol buried? You know, what is in the truck? So these legends have a lot of staying power, clearly. How do you go about getting to the bottom of it? Is it typically as simple as calling somebody who would know? That, yeah, there, there was a great, there's a comedian whose name escapes me, uh, but he talks about what, uh, he was uh, had a problem with sleepwalking, and one night he actually jumped out of the second story of his hotel room while sleepwalking. And he talks about going into the hotel lobby, and all the phones are ringing off the hook because guests are saying that somebody jumped out of their hotel while screaming. And he says, so I said, hello, because you have to start somewhere. And that's a, that's really good advice when you're you know when you have to ask someone a question about something that sounds completely absurd, start with hello, uh, and and then just kind of you know ease into it and say so. I know this may sound a little strange, but you know my understanding is this is uh, what people believe, and um, what can what can you say about it? Thankfully, there are several. Uh, historians within the military, especially the army, uh, who can say, no, this is nonsense. And a lot of the times I would hear is, well, you're not the first person to ask about this. There was a, a widely held belief that the 1st Cavalry Division's unit patch was a sign of shame uh, to signify something from the Korean War. And when I talked to our army historians, they said, no, this is not true. In fact, the unit that you're talking about was not in the 1st Cavalry. And yet it just the, the legend lived on, and they had been asked about it several times. That's amazing. Well, let's talk about some of my favorite military myths and legends, and you've already referred to quite a few of them. But the, the perennial trope of recruits of various services be get, being given saltpeter at boot camp as uh, something to basically suppress libido and help them to focus on training. Uh, that's absolutely wild and out there, and I still hear it in circulation today. So mm -hmm. what's the deal with that legend? Oh, it's been going around for, I think, since World War II. And it's funny because after the story broke, I got an email from a concerned girlfriend uh, who said, you know, I've sent my, my boyfriend pictures in basic training and they're not doing anything. And I just kind of went, well, I'm not a doctor, so I really can't answer that. I can say that, you know, physical exertion will decrease the libido. I'll tell you that. But um, when I called up the services, they said giving recruits a substance that they're unaware of counts as poisoning uh so they don't do that um it, it, it it's it's kind of illegal um but that's uh it's been going around since the dawn of time and 
you know, that was also one where I, I had to say, okay, so just checking, it, it, does this does this really happen? Amazing. So let's talk about some others. Um, a legend about the army formerly issuing stress cards to recruits oh. that they could wave in the face of drill instructors who pushed them too hard. That was a long, complicated drama because I first wrote a story about it and said there are no stress cards. And then somebody sent me a picture of something that looked like a stress card. And it was kind of a, a lost in translation moment, which uh, there was a commission that was looking into the military under the Clinton administration. And they had noted, and they had made some note about stress cards that they could be waved in the face of the drill instructor or drill sergeant and said, I'm stressed out. Well, that's not what they were. They were um, known as blue cards, but they were uh, given to recruits basically saying, if you were feeling overwhelmed, talk to the chaplain. It was not a get out of PT card. It was not stop yelling at me card. It was, you know, are you, know, are, are you okay? If not, here is your stress level. If you're feeling stressed, talk to the chaplain. But the commission had misinterpreted that. And the fact that, these, that the actual cards existed have perpetuated the legend. So I wrote a follow-up story, uh, basically saying, here's my doctoral dissertation of stress cards, because it took a lot of research. And I was very happy to see that at the time, the, the Defense Department had a very good archive of, um, of uh, news briefings and so on. So I was able to find the actual briefing and the, the actual report where this uh, was mentioned and to see that okay, this is a misunderstanding, but it has, you know, as they, there's a term simulacrum or the, uh, the, the, which I used to know what it meant, but it actually applies in this situation where the copy originates the original, where the, the legend simply will not go away because people say, nope, I, I, I have this card, it proves it. And there's also this desire, I think, from everyone who's gone through boot camp or recruit training to say that it was the toughest possible when I went through it. And ever since then, it's been getting easier. And now, uh, you know, recruits have it so easy uh, that, you know, if they had to go through what I did, they would simply cry. <laughs> so here's another one that I think uh, Marines also get quizzed on. The blood stripe that appears on the trousers of non-commissioned officers and officers, their dress uniform. Uh, what's the story with that? It was fortuitous. Um, I was writing a story about how there, it, at the time, there was no formal regulation that said Marines couldn't put their hands in their pockets. But it kind of fizzled because uh, I told my football boss, well, they do have gloves. And he said, well, if they have gloves, that, that kind of defeats the, the purpose. But I got a call from someone who I won't name uh, because he's gone on to other things, uh, telling me to look into this blood stripe myth. And the myth is at the Battle of Chapultec, which was during the Mexican-American War, so many NCOs were killed taking this Mexican castle in Mex in, uh, that, that the uh, trousers for NCOs, which is when you become a, an E4, uh, have a red stripe along the side to commemorate their sacrifice. And I call up Marine Corps History Division. They said, yeah, we get asked about this all the time. First of all, the, the cat, there, there were not, this was not a huge bloodletting, you know, no offense to the, those, the actual battle, but the, the NCOs were not dis, disproportionately uh, casualties. The, the, this is what really kind of put salt into the wounds is that the stripe is actually taken from the army, uh, that they, they oh, no. adopted something from the army uniform. Now, to every corporal who got the, you know, the blood stripe and, you know, the unofficial ceremony is to get it beat on and, and to have people punch you and, and so you get bruises and you've just gotten your blood stripe. I'm sorry, you had to go through that ritual for something that comes from the army, but that was the truth. And uh, yes, Marines were extremely, I don't want to say angry, that doesn't capture the emotion. They, they were not happy with that. Uh, they, they thought that that was an insult to core lore. And it is, it's something that, that they have to memorize in recruit training. It's, it's, it's one of the stories that you know, makes the Marine Corps separate from the other services. And it turns out there's, it's, 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 it's a legend. 
sadly enough. All right, one more. Um, can troops be punished for damaging government property if they get a sunburn? Well, there's actually a, a little bit of truth to that uh, because since it, it's come out that, uh, I mean, unfortunately, in, in more serious cases where we're where someone has been assaulted and, 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 and bled on their uniform and the uh, unsupportive chain of command accused them, uh, charged them with, with uh, damaged property. But yeah, the, this, this, this particular story came from my boss uh, at the time, who I won't name, but he had uh, fallen asleep on the beach and gotten badly sunburned and his supervisor uh, in the Air Force threatened it to uh, charge him. Well, not charge. I think you can get um, you, you can get non-judicial punishment for destruction of government property, which didn't happen. But this is not actually too far from the truth. At the time, I said this is preposterous. It simply cannot happen. Legal experts say that there's nothing that you can justify it. Well, that said, I don't want to say it can't happen because what I've learned since then is military law is pretty funny and fungible. And there is latitude, uh, and the, you know there, are, and, and of course the, the famous phrase "different spanks for different ranks." So in the case of this, the story, I talked to military justice experts who said, "No, you cannot be charged for government uh, uh, damaging government property if you get a sunburn. You know, you are not government property." Doesn't mean that it hasn't been tried since and may have been successful. I, I can't say. So is there a favorite uh, myth or legend that you investigated that we haven't talked about so far? I mean, it's, it's kind of like asking which of your children are the favorites <laughs> uh, you know, in their own way. I, I think the one that has stood the test of time was whether the Taliban were training monkeys in Afghanistan as snipers to attack U.S. troops. Uh, th- this started in an and I think it started in a Chinese newspaper. Uh, I actually called up the, the Chinese embassy about this to, to ask who their source was. Um, but there was quickly pictures online showing some kind of monkey. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on the species with what turned out to be a toy gun. And this was the proof that the Taliban were using, were, were training monkeys to to attack u.s troops and i called up the pa the public affairs officer in afghanistan he gave me a wonderful response you know just so deadpan about how this is not true and then i called up a scientist who explained that you know the sheer amount of bananas that would have to be used to train monkeys to do this was so uh incalculable and so overwhelming (laughs) that it would defeat the purpose and, you know, that, that was the, the, because I was working on a serious rumor at the time. It wasn't so much a rumor. It was uh, we had heard that um, this was on the Obama administration. Troops in Afghanistan could not uh, have a round in the chamber when they went outside the wire. OK, we found out that this was not for all troops in Afghanistan. This was a company commander um, who had told his troops that uh, and this was in the days of um uh, you know, courageous restraint and not shooting back and, and, and um, General McChrystal. So when I found out what particular unit it was, and I asked the folks in Afghanistan, wouldn't you know, they were uh, quickly allowed to uh, put around in the chamber. But I was working on that story and I saw, I, I think it might have been the, uh, the British press picked up this story about the, 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 the uh, monkey snipers and did the story, and I was honored that at the time there was a Taiwanese media outlet that made these, I don't want to say cartoons, but um, animes of stories. And that story got turned into an anime. Unbelievable. And ultimately it was just an unrealistic amount of bananas, and that was that was what tipped it over into the falsehood territory, it sounds like. Well, that was part of it. And later someone said, hey, you know, the story of the uh, the monkey holding the weapon in color, you can clearly see that's a toy plastic gun. Um, <laughs> and and the, the monkey or chimpanzee is on a leash. Uh, so um, no, th- this is not an, uh, an 0311 uh, chimpanzee. 
I also love that you're one of the few reporters I know who has a, a Taliban spokesman basically on speed dial. You've got somebody over there that you can check in with on these things. Well, I mean, they, they get back to me eventually. It's not like I'm, uh, but yeah, I, uh, they send me their statements and I ask them questions and they just repeat what they told me. I mean, I did make one of them uh, a little angry getting into kind of a, a Twitter exchange with him when they claimed they hadn't suffered any casualties in a U.S. airstrike. And I said, well, here's the video. Can you do, you know, roll call? If you're missing 22 people, then you know. But uh, <laughs> that was a while ago. These days, you still find time to investigate legends from time to time. Can we talk about your quest to find the secret fighter pilot bar in the Pentagon? Uh, how that came to your attention and how you ultimately, to the satisfaction of many, tracked it down? Well, you know, I'd heard about the fighter pilot bar before. It was kind of a, a myth. This, I guess this gets back to something I found out that was true. But I received a, an email from someone saying, hey, Jeff, are there still, do uh, officers in the Pentagon still have bottles at their desk? So when Friday comes around, they have happy hour. And I wrote a, a fairly vanilla story where they said, absolutely not. That tradition of, um, of alcohol in, in the Pentagon went away 40 years ago. And then so after I wrote that, you know, there was just one line in there about, you know, the mythical fighter pilot bar, which I had heard about for years. And after the story ran, uh, a colleague who I won't name to protect his identity, he said something effective, hey, Jeff, you know, there is a fighter pilot bar. And I forget whose idea it was to go find it, but he, I, and someone else would track, they just went, okay, it was a slow day in July, find it. So we go through this very circuitous route. When I actually saw where it was, it was much closer to where I was sitting than I expected. And <laughs> going through the bowels of the Pentagon, at one point I see a sign that says NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, and I said, no, we're not going there. We were looking for some kind of marker. It was a potted cactus, I believe. <laughs> and fortunately, the cactus has since been moved. A friend told me that there was a code for you would walk by the room, you would knock on a certain wall, and then they would let you in. So we were walking around, and he kind of looks around, and he says, oh, see where that guy went in? That's it. So, you know, in a rare bout of courage, I walked to the door, and I rang the bell, and bing, bong, and my two friends scattered. I mean, it was just <laughs> I turned around, they were, they took off like a, like a shot. Open the door and this Air Force officer looks at me and said, hi, I'm Jeff with Task and Purpose. I'm here to see the, the fighter pilot bar. Fortunately, the guy had read the story I did and said, okay. It was almost as if he expected me. Uh, and he led me through and I said, okay, okay, this is it. And this is the popcorn maker I've heard so much about that, that does the popcorn. And okay, here's the missiles from the ceiling. You know, the descriptions that I've heard about it fit. Like I'm in, I'm in the place. Uh, this is it. This is real. I didn't really stick around very long because it, it would be weird to, you know, take notes. Once say, okay, it's here. I understand. I, I've seen it. I can verify it. And I quickly retreated. And I think my friends were were kind of surprised that I had lived through the experience. Uh, you know, kind of like the end of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they actually see the face of of God. And it's like, well, you can't see that and live. No, I, I had survived, and uh, back, and I emailed my boss, and I, I had been working on something else that wasn't very good, and I said, oh, well, I found the fighter pilot bar, and you know, it was just a revelation. Which, uh, it was such a breath of fresh air. I said, okay, well, I'll write that up. I hear there's also a space bar. People who know where it is are certainly not going to say, because you have to have a security clearance to get in there. Whenever I get back to the Pentagon, I will look for it. Stop the presses. Is this a bar that has sprung up with the newly established Space Force, or is this something that has ostensibly existed for some time? Oh, this this has existed for a while. You know, I, it may get prominent, not prominence, but uh, now that uh, Space Force has stood up, but no, they, there has been a space bar, and I've, I've heard about it before. And then one day I said, well, I'll, I'll find that too. I mean, that's a little dicier because space, of course, is the most classified space. I don't know if they have an armed guard at the door. I doubt it. But uh, I will certainly see if I can look it up. And it's the final frontier. 
I hope you do. And I hope that this time you actually get to taste of the the sweet nectar on offer behind the bar. <laughs> it sounds like they did not, in fact, offer you a shot of whatever was on the rail at the fighter pilot bar. Didn't stick around long enough. I, I mean, I didn't want to really bother them. I just wanted to say, okay, it's here. I see it. Is everything I expected it to be and, and, and left. I mean, I was kind of hoping there would be a DJ and, you know, Skynet would be there, but no, it was. You still have a desk at the Pentagon. Obviously, we're in strange times now, but what is a rumor or a legend or a, a mysterious spot that you'd still like to get to the bottom of that you haven't had a chance yet? Oh, you know, other than the, uh, the, the space bar, I still am writing about UFOs because been in the news kind of says a lot that, you know, the, the Navy released these videos and kind of shrugged, but continue to, to look into that um, because why not? And uh, to think about that a little more to see what other ins and myths to, uh, to delve into as they, as they arise. Jeff, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Can you tell our audience where to find you and your work? I'm on Task and Purpose, which is three words, uh, www.taskandpurpose.com. You can find me in my apartment where I have been working for the past nine weeks in front of my computer. I have put on a lot of weight. A uh, pair of jeans no longer fits. Jeff, you're doing God's work. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on Left of Boom. On this episode, Jeff mentioned Odierno, that's General Ray Odierno, the 38th Chief of Staff of the Army, who retired in 2015. The comedian whose name escaped him, that was the very funny Mike Berbiglia. We'll have new episodes coming soon, so please hit subscribe and let us know what you think about the show in the feedback section. We also want to hear from you about future episodes. Who do you want to hear from and what military hot topics would you like us to tackle next? Let us know by sending us an email at podcast at military.com. And remember to stay up to date on all the news that matters to the military community every day at military.com.